when you sort of deconstruct what we do, um, uh, airlines fly the same types of aircraft, we put people in the same types of seat, um, we, put, uh, we fly between the same two airports um, on, a, on a given route. So the scope to really differentiate ourselves from the next guy is actually quite limited. Every airline, however, has to find some way of differentiating itself. And at Hawaiian Airlines, what we've chosen is to say, you know, we, we want to, to, to capture the sense of hospitality and all of the wonderful, wonderful cultural attributes of Hawaii, which um, people so appreciate, and we want to bring that forward to the customer experience. And so far, and I cannot guarantee you it'll always be the case, but so far, we felt that the cost of providing the food, and it is very costly, it's tens of millions of dollars a year, really sets up a customer experience that helps make us fundamentally different than our competitors. Mark Dunkerley joined the senior management team at Hawaiian Airlines in 2002, three months before the airline filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. Today, under his leadership, Hawaiian Airlines is turning a profit. Mark Dunkerley, next on Long Story Short. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox is Hawaii's first weekly television program produced and broadcast in high definition. Aloha mai kako, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Mark Dunkerley, Chief Executive Officer of Hawaiian Airlines, developed his love of aviation at a very young age. His unconventional childhood involved traveling by himself on airlines that often took him halfway around the world. Life began for me in Bogota, Colombia. And uh, I, I, the child of um, two economists, both my mother and my father, uh, were economists specializing in the developing world. And they spent the balance of their careers as, as civil servants um, working either for different governments or they had a stint teaching for a little while. Uh, and then um, my father settled in an international organization, the World Bank in Washington, D.C., um, looking after uh, the urban poor around the world. And do you have siblings? I have two siblings. Uh, I have a younger brother and an older half-sister. You spent most of your formative years in boarding schools. Given the nature of my parents' jobs, uh, we would typically move um, every couple of years from one country to another. And I lived in, in Ghana, uh, in Africa. Um, we spent a little stint of time in Boston and also um, in the UK during this period of time. And when my parents took um, uh, a, a job in when my father took a job um, in Washington, D.C., the expectation was that that would probably only last a couple of years and we'd be off somewhere else. So they were keen that I should be part of a single education system. And so I was sent away to boarding school in England on the basis that no matter where we lived, um, I would be part of the same system, same schooling, uh, and, and so on. Of course, no sooner had they done that than uh, they ended up settling in Washington, D.C. For, essentially for good. Um, but yes, from a very young age, I think I was seven years old at the time, I was packed off to boarding school in England, and it was 600 years old, and we'd l led this sort of Dickens slash Harry Potter type life with no heating. And Did you really? No heating? Oh, yeah. I mean, so we lived in the original buildings, and to this day, actually, it's kind of amusing when people ask about that. You know, they have, they come in with this view that, you know, I mean, how, how wonderful would it be to live in a in a building 600 years old, and well, I can tell you, it's miserable. Um, I, you, you know, the the we didn't have bathtubs. We had agricultural tubs that you had to pull up to tap to the taps and fill with hot and cold water, uh, and then you hopped in them. It was like Lee Marvin, you know. And one of these, <laughs> I mean, it's just hard to imagine, but uh, true. And we we lived in these dorm rooms with not only no heating, but because the buildings were so old. None of the windows were double glazed at all. They, they weren't, and so everybody went to bed at night with a hot water bottle in, in the winter. Seven is so young to to be, you know, to, to be packed off as you as you described it. Yeah, it is. And you know, the funny thing is, um, as a child, your sense of normalcy is defined by the circumstances in which you're living. 
because you don't have much of a sense of the broader world or perspective. So I didn't think it was particularly odd. Did um, you, do you remember your parents dropping you off or was that a fateful day or, or not anything remarkable? Yeah, I actually remember it pretty clearly. The, the, I remember being told that I was going to be going to, to a boarding school um, and it didn't sort of compute at the time. Uh, I then have a recollection of going uh, to school and climbing on the airplane with my mother and driving up and being introduced to the school. Um, and, um, and, and again, it was sort of unreal. The thing I remember perhaps best from that period of time was traveling alone. I mean, I was seven, eight years old and you know, lugging my trunk. This is in the days before luggage had wheels and you know, catching trains and buses to get to the airport to climb on a plane uh, to fly back to Washington, D.C., and of course to reverse it. Um, you would do that by yourself? You didn't have any uh, companion? Yeah, yeah, yeah I, did, I did it by myself. And again, I mean, in the context of today's world, um, that seems extraordinary, but um, we all did. I mean, I, there was a train, and as soon as I got on the train, there'd be some friends or some kids from, obviously from the UK, who just lived 100 miles away, and then there'd be other kids who just got a plane from Hong Kong uh, or from, uh, fr from somewhere else, Latin America, for example, um, or, or going to school. And we didn't, it didn't occur to us to think of it as being unusual or odd. It was well, that, just that's the train. Reality. What about the plane? So in the plane, um, yeah, we, we travel, travel by ourselves. And uh, this is where I think I got an early inkling um, that I would end up in, in, in aviation because these were very glamorous days to be traveling. You know, the idiom was coined the jet set. You don't hear people talk about that today. But at the time, um, uh, you know, it was pretty unusual to see a, a little kid by themselves on an airplane and of course, I, I was extremely well looked after on the airplane. I mean, I, it, this was, there was um, no lack of, uh, lack of attention and so on, and it sort of kindled at least some of the interest that I've had in aviation and travel, which has stayed with me to so this day. So it's exciting and safe, people taking care of you and the plane oh, you know, yeah. defying gravity. Yeah, I remember my first ride on a 747. I mean, how good was that? You got this m enormous, enormous airplane that, uh, um, and and um, I was very fortunate to have this experience at the time when very few people traveled, and I knew it, and I appreciated it even at the uh, even at that age. Hard, candidly, though, it was to be separated from home uh, the way that I was. When you look back, do you do you wonder why your parents did that, or was that what people did at the time, especially um, in their field? Well, my, my parents were absolutely resolute that, uh, that they really would leave, could, could likely only um, leave us the quality of the education okay. that we had, and, and that was always the plan. Um, so I think the, whatever their personal feelings, getting a good education was um, absolutely at the top of their list, and they were prepared to make sacrifices themselves, in fact, sacrifices on my behalf, frankly. Um, to make sure uh, that that took place. How often did you see them? So I would see them three times a year, and I would be back for a couple of months in the summer, and then sort of three weeks in spring, and, and three weeks over over Christmas. Um, and you know, everybody I went to school with was essentially in the same boat, and so it didn't strike us as being quite so unusual as it appears today. And. What was life at boarding school like when you were in your grammar school years? I mean, were, did you get a lot of attention from, you know, from staff? Well, you know, it was, um, so if I really focus through that period and into, into my high school years, these boarding schools are interesting and somewhat odd places. Uh, the quality of the education is very high, very high. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's been the great asset that my parents um, have bequeathed me. There's no question about that. Um, you have very few um, adults supervising a lot of kids. Uh, so some things have, have stayed with me ever since. I mean, I, they, they, the way they stop the student body from burning the place down, which they would do unquestionably <laughs> if left to their own, own devices, is um, 
you know, they make sure that you're busy from dawn to dusk. With what? With schoolwork? Oh, there's schoolwork. Athletics? There's lots of sports, lots of schoolwork. You've got to clean the place. You've got to, there are all kinds of um, sort of chores and things that you have, have to do. And it's, it's by keeping you occupied essentially all of the time is how they sort of essentially control the uncontrollable, you know, great sort of mob of kids. Um, so, you know, that's, that's one of the things that I, that I, I, I took away. At the same time, uh, you know, without very many adults around, it's a pretty, you, you develop the ability um, to look after yourself. There aren't any corners you can hide. There aren't any. You don't. You don't wait for somebody to come kiss your boo boo kind of thing. Yeah, co yeah <laughs> co correct. And 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 you know, children in that collective environment can be rather cruel to one another. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, and of course, they get over it a day or two later, and then and then alliances change. The Lord of the Flies is a famous book, which is. It felt very biographical, frankly, from, <laughs> from, from the way that things were. So to survive and prosper in a, in a, in a boarding school, you've, you've, you become, you learn some life lessons. You become quite self-reliant at a very, very, very early age. You don't have much um, uh, adult sympathy um, mm -hmm. a, a, available to you. It's in that sense, it's school of hard knocks. And it's sort of an interesting contrast because I was extremely fortunate to get a great education at one of the most famous uh, uh, English boarding schools um, that, that's out there. And so I'm amongst the very privileged few. Uh, at the same time, um, it was a school of hard knocks. Mark Dunkerley says he didn't have any particular ambitions when he was a kid and instead was satisfied with just getting by. It wasn't until he nearly finished his education and entered what he calls the real world that his many years at boarding school started to pay off. So you're, you're a kid and you're jet setting. Uh, mm -hmm and meeting your parents three times a year for summers and vacations. What was your plan? I mean, did you have a, you knew you loved aviation. Um, did, you have, did you have grand plans as a kid? You know, I, I, I really didn't. And in, in fact, um, uh, I was a very sort of poor student. Uh, I mean, notwithstanding the fact that I um, had always managed to sort of scrape into um, uh, some pretty good schools, always by the skin of my teeth. Once at those schools, I then set about doing as little as I possibly could. So you you would like to be busy, but you didn't like to get ahead on the in yeah, your schoolwork. Yeah, co co correct. I mean, I I, I didn't find you know I, I struggled to um, keep interested um. in in you know the, the the subject matter, and I was considered um, a sort of sort of minor jock at school. I mean, I was um, in the sports that I cared about. I was typically in the school team, but I was never I, never the star, never somebody that people would, would you know, be talking about um, on Saturday afternoon after the game was over. So I, I had a lot of interest in, in, in sports, but, but I was not particularly focused or driven. Uh, and it was, um, I think, a, a, a real surprise to people who knew me when in my 20s I became considerably more focused than I am because I think up to that stage <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I th think they probably would have said that um, I seemed um, uh, largely without direction and focus. Being at a boarding school makes you in some respects quite mature um, because you, you have to deal with some very complicated human interactions because as I mentioned um, you don't benefit from you know parental guidance and so on. So you've got to learn pretty quickly. That in some senses, I think I was quite mature, but in a range of other senses, um, I, I wasn't particularly mature at all. You went to the London School of Economics, and then what happened then? So I, so I was at London School of Economics, and I went to at LSE um, uh, largely because it was not a campus university. It was a university in the middle of, of, of London. And, uh, and during that period of time, I wasn't that focused on work. Um, I was focused on having a pretty good time in London, um, and, it, and, and I enjoyed that. Coming to the end of my time at, at LSE, my game plan, such as it existed, um, was to 
uh, go and get a PhD in economics and follow in my parents' footsteps um, uh, in, in that area. But I, I really felt that you know, four or five more years, or given my attributes as a student, perhaps eight, nine, ten more years um, as a student, you know, it didn't seem like such a good alternative. And um, there was, I, I had this interest in aviation, um, and there was a master's program available in the economics of air transportation, hmm. uh, and I won a scholarship, so I, I took that. It was a one year, um, one and a half year master's program, so I went and studied at Cranfield. And it was really then um, that I felt that I sort of found my calling and wanted to be in aviation. Finally, things just came together for you? Yeah, they did. I, I, there was something about the real world that, um, uh, that I found sort of stimulating and appealing. And, you know, my background is um, sort of interesting in as much as it's very different. But as a consequence of that, I didn't naturally fit in in any environment. I've, I've never in my life been part of any sense of a majority, mm -hmm. um, uh, you, you know, whether it was at school, um, vacation time, I went to the United States and so I didn't share and, you know, I, I didn't see what movie was on a, on Christmas Day in the UK because I was in the US and so I, I, in all kinds of kind of little ways mm -hmm. um, uh, my background was always sort of defined by being sort of um, uh, in the minority um, and not to say I've ever been disadvantaged by that because I clearly have not. It wasn't really till I got in, into the workplace where the very things that to find me in that way, I think we're an asset as opposed to... You're an outlier who could look at situations yeah. with detachment. And, and when you, you're coming about the real world, I, 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 I sense maybe um, you liked, you know, the net was gone, you're, you're on the rope without mm -hmm. a net and that was more exciting. Yeah, no, it, 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 it has been, um, you know, much more exciting and, I, and I've en enjoyed that and um, uh, it's... When I look at in the professional workplace, um, I'm always struck by how difficult a time people have, not all people obviously, but many people have in making decisions. And um, making decisions based part on analysis, but never with perfect information, uh, and largely based on the accumulation of one's personal experience, is something I've always felt comfortable with. That That's not something that that keeps me awake at night. Do you think that came from having to negotiate these unfamiliar situations throughout your your school life? Yeah, without I, adults that you your without your parents around. Yeah, and no, I, I I think that's exactly right. I mean, I've always had to kind of work my way through from first principles, and it's that aspect of life that, that I enjoy, and I still find uh, very, very stimulating. Mark Dunkerley earned a Master of Science degree in Air Transport Economics and started his career in aviation. He advanced quickly and soon made his way into senior management positions at several different airline companies before moving to Hawaii to work for Hawaiian Airlines. Now, based on your track record in airlines, you, you know, you, you came here and everyone trumpeted you as a turnaround expert. And, and, and amazingly, you led a transformation at Hawaiian Airlines, which so many people thought could not be done. Uh, and I, I personally was surprised that you stayed after bringing the, the airline to very good financial health. But I suspect you've stayed because it's, it's never going to be easy and you like that. Yeah, I, I think you're, I think you're exactly right. First of all, you, you know, I, I get uh, people are very generous and they give me great accolades for for the transformation that Hawaiian has has enjoyed. But nobody should be under any illusion. This is the hard work of everybody in our company, and um, you know, it's it's really my great privilege and benefit to be part of this company. Um, it's certainly, certainly not the other way around. Um, but you know this is this is a tough business. It's competitive every day. We're a tiny airline in a land of giants. We are one twentieth the size of our major competitors, and so we are on our toes. And that challenge, in a sense, gives me the same enjoyment, the same thrill, 
um, that being in the middle of a turnaround does. This is a fascinating business. It's exciting. Uh, there's a new challenge every day. There's never a dull, a dull moment. Um, you have to, as a, as a manager in it, you've got to balance a sense of the strategic direction with being prepared to make very quick decisions day to day to protect your position or to improve it. Um, and it's kind of, it's a full on exercise. There, you know, there's not, I'm not a golfer, but this is, there's not much time for taking an afternoon off to play golf. People in our business work very, very hard. And that either stimulates you and you find it really interesting, uh, in which case there's no business like it, um, or it doesn't, in which case it's the wrong business for you. Based on what you learned at boarding school, do you, has any of that um, kept, stayed with you? For example, do you keep yourself busy all the time? And do you also keep your own counsel and not look for uh, other people to um, guide you? Um, yes, I keep busy all the time. Um, and it's natural to me. I'm, I'm incapable of sitting on a beach for an afternoon. I mean, I'd utterly in, it, incapable of, of doing so. So that, that is a, a life lesson that has stayed with me uh, to this very day. And left to my own devices, um, I do tend to keep my own counsel and, um, uh, you know, have, have absorbed that aspect from, from growing up. Where, where that has changed is that, um, is my wife, who's from Latin America, has the opposite temperament to mine, um, and she has taught me a great deal. I mean, I'm a much better and more rounded person for having come to see and recognize that there is, um, you know, there's a different strategy for succeeding uh, a, a, as a human being to, to my own, and that's helped me well, understand how, how so does much. her approach work for you? She is a much more intuitive uh, person, has much better um, sense of how, of, of where, uh, the limitations of analytical thought and logic mm -hmm. and where intuition and emotion take over. And it has uh, been a valuable, um, an interesting lesson for me in my life uh, to, to, appreciate, to see that, to appreciate that, and it's made me a far more effective uh, adult. Bringing the emotional intelligence in. Yeah, yeah. And discernment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, 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 absolutely. Um, and uh, without that influence, I think I, I would be um, uh, much less able to understand um, the sort of broad dimensions and the three-dimensional nature of, of people and society and situations. What do you do in your spare time and, and what, what counts as relaxation? In the day of emails and texts and so on, there really never is a day that is truly mm -hmm. ever um, a, a, a away from what's from what's going on, but I, the things that I enjoy doing is I, I, I enjoy um, I enjoy travel to this day. My wife and I uh, enjoy going places. We're particularly fond of um, uh, the African continent and and, um, and India and Latin America as well. Um, uh, so we, when we can get away and do that, which isn't very often, we do that. I have taken up again. Uh, Fly fishing, which is something, a, a, a pastime, I, the one pastime I shared with my father, which um, uh, after I started work, I, I didn't get to do for about 30 years, but I started up about five years ago. Uh, and an afternoon on the stream um, remains to this day probably the easiest way to clear my mind. And how much do you personally identify with Hawaiian values, Hawaiian culture? You know, I, 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 it really it's better for other people to judge that than me, me myself. I would like to think that they would say a, a, a great deal. I have lived in many, many different places, and as I mentioned earlier, I've always been used to really being, being a minority in the context of where I am. It has made me, um, I think, more open and more sensitive, perhaps, to uh, other cultures and other values than, than other people might be. And as I've looked around, and I've had the luxury, frankly, of being able to pick and choose those attributes that, um, that I think resonate with me, I find myself um, over and over and over uh, coming back to what terrific uh, values um, uh, Hawaii stands for and, and, and how much, therefore, I feel comfortable here. I've lived in Hawaii now longer than I've lived anywhere else in my life, which is 
pretty extraordinary. From being a very young jet setter, to piloting planes himself, to his career as an airline leader, flying has defined Mark Dunkerley's life. Mahalo to Mark Dunkerley of Honolulu for sharing his life stories with us. And mahalo to you for joining us. For PBS Hawaii and Long Story Short, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Ahui ho. For audio and written transcripts of all episodes of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, visit pbshawaii.org. To download free podcasts of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, go to the Apple iTunes Store or visit pbshawaii.org. And then you do something pretty crazy, which is acrobatic flying. Yeah, that's been, that's been a really important part of my life. Um, uh, you know, I, 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 in graduate school, um, uh, I saved up and I uh, learned how, how to fly. Uh, and in my early professional days, I, I would go out, uh, rent an airplane about once a month just to keep current. Um, and I enjoyed doing that. Um, but then somebody said, hey, have you ever flown in an aerobatic airplane? And I was game to try it. By the time we came down, I wanted to learn how to do this and, and so on. And, and that started about a decade long uh, time when I got into competition flying um, and I flew uh, all kinds of aerobatic contests, domestic and international ones. Um, and it was kind of a defining uh, hobby for me. And even when I moved to Hawaii and stopped competing because there are no contests here and, and so on. Um, I continue to do it, and uh, I'm never quite as happy as I am uh, flying an airplane upside down 